Uh, hi, I'm Kerry. Thanks for joining me for the next hour. Uh, this is my thinking clearly about performance paper. I just watched Maria's talk, so I may say about a little bit funny because I tend to absorb other people's accents and that, that Canadian uh, Irish accent still in the room. Anyway, welcome. Uh, I've got a, a good full hour for you. Uh, let me introduce myself very, very quickly here. Um, I'm Kerry. I come from a company called Method R Corporation. We've got software and services and things. Um, a few years back, a colleague and I named Jeff Holt uh, wrote, a, wrote a book called Optimizing Oracle Performance for O'Reilly. You may have seen that. And before that, I spent uh, a decade at Oracle Corporation where I ran a, uh, about an 85-person group who did uh, performance optimization. So my whole career since 1989 when I started with Oracle has been about performance. And that's what, uh, basically, it's all I do. And that's what this presentation is about today. The, uh, the website, if I can uh, show you real quickly, if you go to method-r.com, there's lots of stuff on our website for you to read if you're interested in anything I'm saying today. Um, and again, that URL is method-r.com. Now for the fun part. The, uh, the intended audience for this presentation is uh, Database administrators, and in that red circle, I like to include SAN administrators, system admins, um, project leaders, people that are that are in in the the responsibility of making sure that a system works after it's been created. And then in the uh, the right hand Venn diagram bubble that you see here are developers. Now, I usually ask for a show of hands how many of these, how many of those, but with a room this big, it's a lot more fun if if we do this with a with an audible kind of a response. So what I'd like to do, just a little bit of fun audience manipulation. We'll get some air flowing and, and make sure you guys are having a little bit of fun anyway. But uh, let me ask you, and I'll ask each of you, I'll ask for DBAs first and then developers second. What I'd like to do is if you're a DBA, I'm going to count one, two, three, and then I want you to go, whoo, like that. Now, the developers are going second. So the second guys always have the advantage over the first guys because they already know how loud the first one is. So the first one needs to be darn loud in order to have any chance of the second one. Now maybe there's only three developers in the room. I don't know. I haven't conducted the query yet. But on the count of three, if you're a database administrator, SAN administrator, um, system, Unix system admin, Linux, Solaris, Windows, whatever, um, I'm going to count one, two, three, and I want to hear you go Hoo, after three. Are you ready? Okay, thank you. The one young lady in the front middle is going to participate. The rest of you are going to be really envious because she's going to have all the fun. Are you ready? If you're a DBA, etc., one, two, three. All right. Quite a few. Quite a few. Now, if, you're, if you primarily identify yourself as a developer, uh, after count of three, I want you to say ha. Are you ready? After three, one, two, three. A few of you kind of clustered in the middle there. Guy off on the corner, yeah, yeah I heard it too, I heard it too. Um, here's my thesis, that when database administrators understand their job, it makes performance better. Okay, no disagreement so far. Um, another thesis is that when developers understand their job, it makes performance better. Now here's where it starts to get tricky. I also believe that developers who understand a little bit about system management make performance better because these people are able to see into the future and understand some of the problems that, uh, that they're creating in January that aren't going to manifest themselves until October sometime after the go live. Um, and on the other hand, I also believe that database administrators who understand something about software development make performance better as well. So the Venn diagram I showed before really needs to look like this. There needs to be some overlap, and out of all the successful and unsuccessful systems I've seen in the past 20 some odd years, 22 I guess coming up, the successful ones all had somebody who was comfortable living in that dark red, dark gray zone between the developers and the database administrators, system administrators, and so forth, the operational support staff. The failed ones had the Venn diagram where the two bubbles were separated. And one of my goals today is to try to, to heal those two groups of people into a cohesive organizational force that can go out and make performance optimal. Now, today's agenda is really long and tricky. I've got 21 little subsections in the slideshow that I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm going to talk about each and every one in the next hour. Um, these things map to that Venn diagram approximately like this. There are some things in the list that developers think of 
as, yeah, that's kind of my thing, that DBAs probably look at and go, eh, I don't really care about that. There's some things that operational management staff think of as, yeah, that's kind of my thing, that developers probably look at and think, eh, I don't really care about that. I'll, I'll give you an example. 16's kind of hanging off here on the west side of the, of the red bubble, and that indicates that DBAs are probably interested in it, developers not so much. And 16 is capacity planning. And sure enough, when's the last developer you met that really was you know, like an active capacity planning type person? Well, hopefully after today there will be more. But uh, on the other hand, maybe 21, 20, um, those have to do with, with things like measuring software performance inside the app, um, dealing with performance as if it's a feature. Well, developers are the people that are in control of in integrating feature sets into the application. So these tend to be things that developers think about a lot, the database administrators and operations administrators tend not to think about a lot. So my goal is to show you these 21 things and compel your interest in all 21 of them so that you can, can act more as if every one of these things is in the overlap between database administrators and developers. So here's the list of topics. We're going to hit them one at a time. Number one is called an axiomatic approach. And the reason that I put this up front is because my experience with performance and people trying to um, give applications good performance attributes in the field has been sort of like how I came across mathematics when I was in school, junior high, high school. When I was in junior high, I really liked math, but I was uncomfortable doing it because I really wasn't sure, I wasn't that confident that I was going to be able to solve the next problem that was assigned to me. And what happened was, I had teachers in the 7th and 8th grade that told me things like, um, you know, 5x plus 4 equals 6. You would say, take the 4 and move it to the other side. And I got the habit of doing that, you know, because I was shown on the whiteboard or blackboard in those days, that that's what you do is you take the 4 to the other side. But why would take the 4 to the other side work? I mean, when you look at that, it looks magic. And not until I met a, a math teacher named Jimmy Harkey, as a freshman in high school that I really understand math. And the way that he taught math to us is the way that I hope to impart some performance things onto you today. So this axiomatic approach is Mr. Harkey's way of saying how he taught his first uh, basically college algebra class in high school. Now on the first day of class, Mr. Harkey handed us a piece of paper that looked like this. Yes, I kept it. Yes, I scanned it. And yes, I'll be happy to send you a copy of the PDF if you want it. I probably am going to blog it in a week or two. I've got a lot of it already written up, and you'll be able to download it from there. It's very difficult to read, I know, but, but what this says, it starts at the top. Given A is an element of the real numbers, and B is an element of the real numbers, and, and some other things, then these following points are true. And I certainly won't read the whole thing to you, but it, it says, for example, that A plus B is equal to B plus A for any two real numbers, A and B. And that law is called the commutative property of addition. And we sat the first day of class, maybe the first couple, it's hard to remember that far back now. But we sat the first couple of days of class just going through this sheet, making sure that everybody in class was comfortable with the concepts that are illustrated here. There's one down over here, um, I think 13, Roman numeral 13. If A equals B, then A minus C equals B minus C. So that means if A and B are equal, you can subtract C from both sides and still have an equality, an, an equal expression. And that's called the subtraction property of equality. So at the end of a couple of days of looking at these things, we had a toolbox full of tools that we could use. And wait for it, here's the catch. Mr. Harkey told us that every single problem we would do in that class the whole entire year, every homework problem, every test problem, would look like this. He told us he didn't care if we knew the answer. What he cared was, could we prove it? So basically what he made us do was write down the problem, 7x plus 4 equals 13, and then every teeny tiny little step we took, we had to refer to a law number from that axioms and postulates page and explain why we made this step. Because he cared how we thought more than he cared whether we were lucky enough to get the right answer by looking at the problem and kind of fishing through a couple of uh, potential solution candidates, which is basically what I've done in the 7th and 8th grade. You look at this and go, wow, if this had been a... Uh, let's see, an 11 instead of a 13, this problem would be much easier. Right? Because I don't have to do fractions in my head. But with Mr. Harkey, it's easy enough. You, you notice that this 4 is kind of hanging off the side where you've got a variable you're trying to solve for. And you'd like to sort of clean up that side of the equation. Well, I can do that by applying the subtraction property of equality law 13. I can subtract 4 from both sides, and I still have an equality. Now, 4 minus 4, according to rule 1A3, the additive inverse property, that reduces to 0. 
and just subtracting 13 minus 4 leaves me 9. Now I've got a, a cleaner expression, but I kind of want to get rid of the 7, so what do I do? Well, according to the division property of equality, as long as 7 is not 0, I can divide both sides by 7, and I'll still have an equality. And by the multiplicative inverse property, 7 something over 7 is just that something all by itself. And suddenly, mathematics became to me not just a bunch of intuitive, God, I hope the next problem is easy for me to solve by looking at. It became an, an endeavor that I could apply these patterns, these rules, and the whole art part of math got, what's the opposite of embiggened? In smallified, using Lisa Simpson vernacular here. Um, it, it, the, the whole magic art thing just went to a very small place where most of it became science because of these rules he'd given out. But the small part that was left over that required creativity was the pattern match of deciding, you know, I want to clean this up. So to get rid of a four, what do I do? I can subtract four from both sides. So it became a pattern matching activity and allowed me to, to solve much more complicated problems. And it left a lasting impression on me because I, I like doing things this way. So. One of the things that you're probably asking if you're paying attention is, well, why? Why have you spent 10 minutes talking about this instead of Oracle stuff? Why is this axiomatic approach so important? And I believe the answer is really simple. It's because knowing matters, but proving matters more. Now, let me also, we'll do this audibly again. If, if, you've, if you've ever worked for somebody, like somebody else pays you your paycheck instead of you not getting paid by somebody else, give, give me a hoop. Come on, everybody suits that criterion, right? Everybody in the room gets paid by somebody else. And if you're a consultant in particular, it's a very direct relationship of you knowing something smart and then telling your client that thing, that smart thing, and that's what gets you paid, right? Kinda, at least? Well, no, what gets you paid is when you compel your client to do the thing that you think is so smart. How many of you have ever come up with the world's most elegant solution to a problem and then, you know, you leave, you write the report, and, and you're so proud of yourself for figuring out the world's most elegant solution to some horrific problem. And then three months later, you meet up at Oracle Open World or some other conference. You see your client and say, hey, how'd that idea that I gave you uh, work out? And they go, well, we kind of never did that. You ever have that happen to you? you know, you know why that happens? Change control, you know, other barriers that are between your idea and their implementation of your idea. Well, I'm telling you, one of the biggest barriers between your idea and their implementation of that idea is whether they are passionately you know, in love with your idea enough to, to jump through these hoops that they have to jump through to make your thing go. So a number of times I've, I felt like I had a smart answer, but I didn't complete the deal by convincing the other person that this is really going to do what I said it was going to do. So that's why I say knowing matters, but proving matters more. So let's start off with some of the simplest parts of uh, the performance roadmap. What is it? When we say performance, what do we mean? And when I say it, this is what I mean. Performance is the time that it takes for computer software to perform whatever task you ask it to do. So that could be a button click. It could be a, uh, a, a command line that fires off a report that prints a bunch of stuff that you need later. Performance is how long, the time it takes for that task to complete. So let's define all the words. A task is a business unit of work. For example, create an order, look up a book by author, post in the journal ledger, those are all examples of tasks. Tasks can nest. So for example, post to the general ledger might have subtasks called post purchasing, post payables, post receivables. Those are all subtasks of a, of a higher order task. Now you all know what time is, so I won't define that for you. But there are two ways to relate tasks to time. You can divide tasks by time, or you can divide time by tasks. Each of those has a name. The tasks divided by time thing is called throughput. This is things like miles per hour, uh, orders per second, jobs per minute. Those are examples of throughput, uh, throughput statements. Dividing the other way, the time divided by task way, is called response time. Response time example units are things like seconds per order, you know, minutes per job, those kinds of things. Now throughput is important. Typically throughput is more important to managers of groups of people that have some sort of a commercial target to meet. Like for example, the leader of an order entry processing organization is probably more concerned with throughput of his department because that's how he or she gets his bonus. That's how 
the department's performance is going to be measured by even higher up levels in the organization. Response time is important too because the individual people who are responsible for clicking and getting answers back or clicking and making sales or clicking and getting reports run on time, those folks are concerned with being able to leave at 5 o'clock so they don't have to pay their babysitters over time. Those are the folks that are concerned with when something takes 20 seconds, it usually takes 2 seconds, it kind of diminishes their productivity and their enthusiasm for the job they're doing that day. So throughput and response time are both important. And at this point, I want to compare throughput and response time because they're related. Throughput and response time are related. Well, you already knew that. Right? When you get on a highway all by yourself, you get great response time. But if the highway is always empty, you've got to write as a taxpayer to ask, why did I spend all these millions of dollars on a 14-lane highway when it's just me every time I get on it? So throughput is a requirement of the people who invested into a system who want to get the most out of it possible. Now most people think that throughput and response time are reciprocals and it's an easy mistake to make. I've made it myself because throughput is tasks divided by time and response time is time divided by tasks so therefore one is the reciprocal of the other but that's actually not true and I can prove that by showing you one counterexample. Imagine that I told you that throughput is 10 tasks per second and I ask you what the average response time is. Well, if you knew you weren't being tricked, which you of course know now that you are, because I just told you that I'm going to prove that this isn't, this isn't uh, sort of uh, intuitively obvious, you would probably say that, that response time has to be a tenth of a second per task. If I get 10 tasks done in a second, then my response time must be a tenth of a second per task. But here's an example system in which that's not true. Imagine I've got a green a, a, a machine, this big green box in the middle here, that's capable of, of taking white little inputs on one side and painting them green. So it takes in white things and it puts out green things. Now, inside this box is a sequence of other little boxes labeled 1 through 10. Now, each of those little machines inside the bigger machine, each submachine can paint a little white thing green, but it takes exactly one second to do that. So here's a machine that I can cram 10 things in all at once. And if these little submachines, 1 through 10, are parallel, independent, and homogeneous, then they can paint 10 things in one second, but the response time for any one of those things is going to be also one second. So what I've done here is shown you that there's an extra parameter that you have to consider when you try to relate throughput and response time. And that is the trick I gave you. It's the number of things inside the little box here. So the response time, all we know, if somebody says I can do 10 tasks in a second, all you know about response time is that it's somewhere between 0.1 and 1. It can't be less than 0.1 or our throughput would have been higher. It can't be more than 0.1 or our throughput would have been lower. So throughput and response time are related, but it's complicated. To know them both, you have to measure them both. Or, as I put in small print here, understand the, the, uh, the complex relationship between the two so that you can model them both. But my recommendation to you is that throughput and response time are virtually independent. At least in experience, people consider them as independent, and therefore you should measure them both separately. We'll move on to unit four here, percentile specifications. Here is an example of a percentile specification. The task is in orange, the time is in red, and the thing I'm defining is in green here. And this says that a click to order task, so apparently pushing a button called order now, or click to order, has to respond in one second or less in 99% of executions. Now this green bit here at the bottom that I've, that I've listed is the percentileness of this particular specification. A lot of you may be familiar with specifications where your boss comes in and says click to order has to respond in a second or less, period. And at that point you have something that's certainly an expression of an intent, but mathematically it's not a very powerful statement because the assumption is it has to happen that way all the time. There's no recognition of the possibility that clicking to order might actually take more than a second. And adding this percentile concept allows you to put some limits on, some flexibility on whether your, uh, your system is, is do, deemed a failure if it misses, say, one out of a million times versus one out of a hundred times. 
So here's a little exercise I'd like you to do in your head. Imagine that you have a one second tolerance for whatever it is that this task's response time lists represent here. And imagine that there are 10 experiences for a person experiencing list A here, and 10 different experiences for somebody experiencing list B. Basically, list A is a list of response times for a given task, and list B is a list of other response times for a given task. If you really have a tolerance of one second, then which of these two lists of response times would you rather experience in real life? Any, anybody say A? Right. Anybody think B is better? All right, I've still I've given this presentation to a couple thousand people. I've never seen somebody raise a hand on B. Now, here's the reason why. It's because B, B violates your expectation more times than A does. Now, there's a trick here. Both of these have the same average response time. List A, if you average these numbers up, comes out to one second exactly. List B has an average response time of one second exactly as well. Yet nobody that I've ever given this presentation to has chosen B as superior over A because they know that, well, first off, the way the average got the way it is is that B has some better response times than the best response time in A. But it has more worse response times than the worst response times in A. People like A better, and here's why. GE figured it out and published it on their website at their Six Sigma page. Customers feel the variance, not the mean. They really don't care that the mean is one second. What they care about is that they were ticked off four times out of ten when they tried the thing. Um, they didn't really care that it was so super fast another four times that it brought the average down because what they feel is the pain of the outliers, of, of the big response times. So that's important and that's why people express response time uh, ambitions in this percentile specification format. On to piece five. Problem diagnosis. Now, this is where I've lived most of my professional career. When I was at Oracle, my job was to go to a different site every week, typically. I went to 30 to 40 sites a year in my, uh, in my younger days. And everywhere I showed up, there would be a performance problem, and my job would be to fix it. So the problem diagnosis project became something of a pattern for me. And what I learned from doing that over and over and over again is that the beginning of that project is the most important thing. Typically, a project was, was either destined to succeed or fail before I ever got there, based on how they asked the question of my manager about what they wanted me to do when I showed up. What I've learned the right start is, is two steps. You need to know the current state, and you need to know the goal state. So the current state of a performance problem is something like, when I click this report, I expect it to run in 10 or 15 seconds, but lately it's been running in 10 or 15 minutes. Can you please fix that? Now, the current state is the 10 or 15 minutes. The goal state is the 10 or 15 seconds. Right? You need to know both. And I'll show you why in a second. So cash this in your head. You have to know both. In a minute, I'm going to ask you a question that looks like a perfectly legitimate question. And the answer is going to be, I can't answer that because I don't know both. You'll see it's going to come in about four or five pages. So the thing about these two questions, though, is that most operational analysts, consultants, and so forth are a little nervous when they ask about number two. A lot of people are really frightened to say to a user, hey, I understand your thing you know, sucks. It takes way too long when you click. How long would you like it to run in? Do you see the, like, my, my left eye like squints when I say that? Because I can't even say that without thinking, oh, God, what if you say something I can't do? Because what you're doing by asking the question is you're, you're sort of tacitly setting an expectation whether you realize it or not. It's like if I were to ask you, how would every one of you like for me to give you a $10 bill right now? You're thinking, well, heck, yeah, see? I give, that's the way you get applause. It's really a cheap thing. Oprah does it all the time. Except she actually gives out the $10 bill in a bag. Yeah, no, in a bag with, like, car keys in it. Um, but just asking that puts your mind in, in, in the context of, wow, this guy might actually give me $10. Then it's really bitterly disappointing when you find out that I'm not. So presenters, consultants, employees, they all get this idea as a kid, most of us, that, wow, don't ever overpromise. Don't even say something that sounds like a promise because you might not be able to deliver and then you're going to look like a, a, a jack wagon. I like that term off of Geico commercials. Jack wagon. Um, so some people are nervous about asking about the goal state, but you have to, and I'll show you why as we go through the slides. So here's the problem. What if the goal state's impossible? You know, somebody says, yeah, I'm printing out the Manhattan phone book twice a week. 
How long would you like it to take? I'd kind of like it to be so so. Hmm, wish I hadn't asked. Okay? We'll get to this in a minute. How can you know whether the goal state is possible or not? Before I answer that question, I want to show a tool or two. And the first tool I want to show you is the sequence diagram. It's part of the UML, the Universal Modeling Language. Java developers, PHP developers, and guys talk about specifications using this kind of a diagram sometimes. The way to read it is that time flows from the top to the bottom direction. And these three vertical lines here represent tiers. Now, tier is an abstract concept. It might, it might correspond to a, uh, a function call level inside of a program with different subroutines that call each other. It might, as in this picture, represent a three-tier architecture where I've got a browser, an application server, and a database. But the way to read this is that demand comes from left to right, and supply comes from right to left. And you can tell the time sequence order by following from top to bottom. So here you see a browser initiated a track shipment type of a transaction to an application tier. A little time passes, the application tier issues a prepare call to the database, which then responds later back in the leftward direction. Then there's an execute call which gets fulfilled, a fetch call gets fulfilled, and finally the track shipment call gets fulfilled by passing maybe some HTML data back to the browser from the application's middle tier. So this is a sequence diagram, and it helps people structure their thinking about the code that they're getting ready to write. Now the nice thing about sequence diagrams is if you draw them to scale, where the vertical distance is proportional to the amount of time it takes for something to happen, then you end up with something that you can actually kind of use as a performance diagnostic tool. So here you can see that track shipment caused a prepare and an execute and a fetch. And the fetch took quite a bit longer than the execute and the prepare. But the thing that took the longest of all was after the fetch came back to the application server tier, it's a really long time before the application server answered back to the browser with the final results. So if you're attempting to fix this performance problem, if this represents a performance problem that you were trying to fix, well, the place that you should probably apply leverage first is to this zone here. I'll point with the, the mouse cursor so you can all see it. It's this bit here that's causing most of the time to be consumed. And a lot of people who are database-centric would go, no, 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 it's the fetch. But I'm telling you, if you really want to address the amount of time it takes for track shipment to, to take place, you have to address the segment here on the application server tier. So this is a good tool for learning information like that. Now the problem with sequence diagrams is this. Imagine that this particular function had 322,968 database calls. Well, you wouldn't be able to read the sequence diagram. There's so many pixels laid on top and near each other that you just can't read it. Now, one simple solution would be, well, let's print this on a really long sheet of paper. We'll, we'll just print this so it goes all the way to Fullerton, California, and we'll just kind of walk along it, and we'll pick up information about what this task is doing. Well, that brings me to a thing that I mentioned the other day in the develop session on Sunday, um, this thing called the Tau Millsap Law. Nobody wants to see more than 10 rows of anything. So when there becomes more than about 10 of these arrows going left or right, I st my mind starts to blur, my eyes start to glaze over, and I start to think, you know, I really don't want to see all that data. I want to see some summarized form of it. So that's what we're going to get to next. To summarize the sequence diagram section, the sequence diagram is a great conceptual tool. It is, in fact, what most people draw on the whiteboard when a consultant comes into town. They show you how control transfers from one tier to the other, you know. But it is a scale as a performance diagnostic tool. Which brings us to section seven, the profile. A profile is simply a tabular representation of the sequence diagram. Sequence diagram on the left is equivalent to the profile on the right. I've made up terms in the function call line, or the function call call, just because I don't want you to be too distracted by what those names mean. It's a pretty simple uh, little, little notation that I've, that I've created here. I've, I've named the tier, a colon, and then a likely sounding subroutine call name for an operation on that tier. And what you can see here is that there were indeed 322,968 database calls called fetch. And it took 1,748.229 seconds. Now, this is kind of the normalized profile. And a profile has a couple of important attributes. It has to be spanning. That is, the rows in the table have to explain all of this 2,468 second experience. No gaps. And it has to be non-overlapping. Non-overlapping means it's not fair to say I spent 10 minutes doing something, nine minutes breathing, and nine minutes pumping blood from my heart. 
Well, you've got to pick a dimension that gives you some orthogonality so that you can not have the overlap problem. Spanning and non-overlapping is just a really simple way of saying that these numbers here have to add up to that number at the bottom. If you have gaps or overlaps, you have problems. It causes you to have to do guessing types of things. So uh, it's also helpful if you list a profile in, in descending contribution to response time order because the important stuff is at the top. That's normally how we want to see it. Now, I didn't invent this concept by any means. Um, Donald Knuth talked about profiling 30, 40 years ago, back in 1970. And if you've ever done a GCC minus PG and a GProf or a Java minus Prof and a Java Profiler Viewer command, you've done this. You've done profiling if you've done any of these things. Now, the nice thing about profiling is it helps you answer the question, where did my code spend my time? And the complementary question, where did my code not spend my time? Now that's interesting to me because back in the 1990s when Oracle sent me a different client site every week, a lot of times what I would do for a living is show up at a customer site and do things like rebalance all of their Oracle data files across a larger set of disks because they used to have 10 disks and now they have 20 and what they want to do is distribute that I.O. load uniformly across the 10 new drives as well. And I would do that, and about Wednesday, I would surface for air, and all the grants and synonyms would be back in place, and the application would be ready to run again. And then, about three times out of four, I'd get my hug. Yeah, it's great, everything's happy, everything's faster the way we'd hoped for it. And, of course, the thing that I worried about was that one time out of four when I didn't get my hug. When, when they would look at me and kind of go, yeah, we saw you do what we asked you to do, but... Frank's report that we run every Thursday is still really slow. And of course, after having that hit me three or four times, I finally started to figure out that I need to be asking about Frank's report on Monday before I do the three days of labor that causes potentially a hit, potentially a miss. So what was happening to Frank's report when I made I.O. faster is, unbeknownst to the company that asked me to make I.O. faster, Frank's report apparently wasn't consuming much I.O. time to begin with. So when I made I.O. faster, it didn't really have much impact on Frank's report. So that's question two. Where did this thing not spend my time? And I've seen lots of people upgrade components of their system and then, and then be disappointed later because it didn't address the problem that they had. So profiles would have stopped any of those kinds of mistakes. Finally, number three is the answer to the question that I opened up a while ago when I asked about the goal state. When you look at a profile, you can tell how long something should run. Because basically a profile is like an invoice for response time. I mean, think about hiring somebody to do something for you that you have to pay them by the hour. I mean, you're paying kids $5 an hour to wash your car. And they come back to you with an invoice for $60, 12 hours of labor to wash your car. I think it's a little weird because usually when I wash the car, it only takes about an hour. So you look at the invoice, if it's itemized, or better yet, if you have film. You look at the invoice, if it's itemized, and say, you know what, I don't think I should have to pay for four hours of what is this sponge and water hose fighting thing. That doesn't belong in my profile. That doesn't belong in the $5 an hour bucket that I'm paying you to get my car clean. You know, the trip to Walmart to buy new sponges because you tore up the old sponges in the sponge board. I shouldn't have to pay for that either. But when you look at a profile for something that takes 10 minutes, and you see nine and, and three quarters minutes of some kind of lock, well, that doesn't belong in your invoice for response time either. So you can look at that profile and see, this doesn't belong here, this doesn't belong here, this doesn't belong here. And what's left is how long your thing should take. So that's the answer about your goal state question. Now that moves us into Amdahl's Law, because profiles and Amdahl's Law are intimately connected. Here's a picture of Gene Amdahl in his, in his prime. Um, Amdahl's Law basically, in a nutshell, says what it says here. It tasks response time can improve only in proportion to how much the task uses the thing you improve. So if you have a one hour long report that does no I.O., then moving your disk drives to faster solid state drives is not going to help. Because you weren't doing any I.O. to begin with, faster I.O. is not going to make any difference. If you've got a 10 minute thing that uses a ton of CPU and you upgrade the CPU, then yes, the CPU portion of your profile is going to be affected by the CPU upgrade. Now where that comes into play, is Amdahl's Law basically gives us our instruction set for how to read and respond to a profile. Here's the same profile I showed you earlier. The same 2,468 seconds, the same 1,748.229 seconds consumed doing DB fetches, but instead of the DB fetch and the other call names in this column, I've exchanged it with 
how much performance improvement do we think we can get from addressing this line in the profile, and how expensive would it be? I've changed the right-hand column to show you what the total percentage of contribution of response time that line makes to this bottom line. So this 70.8 is simply the one point, or sorry, 1,748 seconds divided by the 2,468 seconds. I've color-coded this to make it easier to see the cheap stuff and the expensive stuff. Let me ask you, if this were your profile, which thing would you work on first? Two? Okay, you remember about five minutes ago I said I'm going to ask you a question. And the only right answer is, I can't answer you because you didn't tell me both things. Remember that part? Here's the tricky part. I told you you've got to know the current state, which I'm showing you, 2,468 seconds. But you also have to know the goal state. Because if you don't know the goal state, you cannot answer the question I just asked you, what will you do first? Here's why. Imagine that the goal state is that your biggest customer, Walmart, who accounts for 175% of your total revenue stream, is going to leave you if you can't make this thing run in less than 2,400 seconds. You hear what I said? You only have to get rid of 68 seconds to win this game. What are you going to do first? Two? I heard some people say two, but my point is, you're lucky if you said two. Because I didn't tell you that other part about Walmart, and you only need 68 seconds back. I probably would do two as well. And probably in a lot of circumstances I would choose two because it's dirt cheap. And if I can tell somebody, look, I'm going to take off 12.3% of your response time and I'll be back in five minutes, you're probably going to do that. Admittedly, you're probably going to do that. If it's truly dirt cheap, you know, change a parameter, don't have to restart the instance, I'll be right back. And then when the thing runs again and it's actually 12.3% faster, you look like a hero, right? You look like the one guy who can see in the midst of all the other people who are blind. You can predict what's going to happen, you do something, and what you predicted actually happens, yay. Now they're probably going to trust you to do the next thing because you were so right on the first thing. I get that. But what if our goal state is that this thing has to run twice as fast? It has to finish in 1,200 seconds, not 2,400 seconds. I might still do two first. I might still do four. I'm probably not going to mess around with six. But what I've just said is if we've got to get rid of half the time that this thing consumes, I have to address row number one. Because I can add up all these other things, and all of them together don't add up to 50%. They only add up to 29.2%. If I have to make this thing run in half the time it takes now, then I have to. I don't care how expensive it is. I have to figure out what's going on up here with number one. So that's why it's so important to know not just the current state, which you get here, but you have to have information about expectations. You have to know what your goal is, or you can't run the race right. So, my point is first assess the whole profile before deciding on your next step. Another thing I don't want you to do is get snagged on number one and think that I can't move to number two until I solve number one. Because if your goal is, hey, we need 20 seconds or 68 seconds back, yeah, you can get it at number two. Okay. That leads us to the topic of a thing called SKU. Now, you've probably heard about SKU when people talk about data and histograms. You know, you, the, the kind of the... Uh, the apocryphal example is the men's magazine that has a, a subscriber table that has a sex column. And the sex column is either M or F, depending on whether the subscriber is male or female. And for this particular type of magazine, 99.99999% of the rows in this table have sex equals M. So should I use an index when querying um, where sex equals some value? And the answer is, well, it depends on what the value is. Right? If I say where sex equals F, then I probably do want to use an index on that sex column because only a couple of blocks in the table have female information in them. But if I'm querying for sex equals M, then I probably want to do a full table scan where I just shred through the table as quickly as I can with large IOs and, and deal with my data results at that way. So SKU is when you have a non-uniformity in the list of your data values in a column. Well, it's also non-uniformity in any list of values, and I'll show you an example here. Imagine, back from the profile I showed you before, the 2,468 second profile, that I told you that DB Fetch, you remember, took 1,748.229 seconds, and that that was because of 322,968 calls. Here's your quiz question. What if I could eliminate 50% of those DB Fetch calls? What would I expect response time to look like? Well, the, the plausible, logical answer is, well, if I eliminate half the calls, I would expect to eliminate half the time. Well, there's a problem with that 
logic. And here's a really simple example to demonstrate what that problem is. Imagine I told you that something uh, made four calls and it took four seconds to make those four calls. And then I said, how much time do you think we would eliminate if we eliminated two of those calls? Now the logical answer is two. But the right answer might not be two. If list A is your world where each call took one second apiece, then it doesn't matter which two I eliminate, my new response time is going to be two seconds. Eliminate two calls, eliminate two seconds, new response time is two seconds. But if list B happens to be my world, where the first call took 3.7 seconds and the other three calls took 0.1, then it makes a big difference which two DB fetch calls we get rid of. If we get rid of calls three and four, well, it's not going to do us much good. Response time is going to be approximately four after I eliminate half the calls. Because 3.8 and four, they feel the same. So, skew matters. All you know is that response time is going to be somewhere between zero and four, which really doesn't help us at all. You have to go look. So, would you eliminate 50% of the time if you eliminate 50% of the calls? Well, I don't know. I can't tell you from just looking at this level of the profile. But I could answer you better if I had some histogram information. And this, by the way, is why Oracle has those underscore hist uh, fixed views now that came out, I think, in 10, 10.1. Um, this is a histogram that says that 75.8% uh, of my response time was spent in calls that lasted between um, 10 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds in duration. And that's where 1,325.8 seconds of my 1,700 seconds went. So if I really want to attack the DB fetch calls in this example, I don't want to get rid of these, or these, or even these, where most of my calls are. I really need to focusedly attack on these 47,444 calls, because those are the big ones where most of the time's going. Now, how do you know where those are? Well, fortunately, in Oracle, we can know that. If you can trace the thing that you're, that you're trying to optimize, instead of just looking at the ASH data or the v dollar, other V$ dollar data, you can actually see where in my trace file did these longest calls occur. And it's relatively easy to pluck this information out of the trace data. So here I can see call by call by call. Where's the most expensive one? I can find out where the most expensive 10,000 are if I want to. Now, minimizing risk. It's a very short, short section, and it's a quick story. Uh, once upon a time, I was in Denmark in January, it was bitterly cold outside, and it was uncomfortably warm inside. I was in a room with about 15, 20 other people, and I walked over to the door thinking, I'm just going to open the door and wave it a couple times to make the room cool off a little bit and I'll be more comfortable. Um, thankfully, I was polite enough to get to the door, and before I opened it, I asked, I said, would you guys mind if I open the door and kind of wave it a little bit, because I'm burning up. I'll leave out one of the words that the, let's call him a respondent, said back to me, but the answer I got back was, why don't you take off your blank sweater? And I looked down and I figured out, yeah, I'm actually wearing uh, Gore-Tex, Thinsulate, and Sheep's Wool zipped up to my ears, long sleeve version from Iceland or something. And I took the sweater off and I, yeah, it was quite nice in there. Which leads to my one and only slide in the minimizing risk section. When everybody's happy except for you, Make sure that your stuff is straight before you start messing around with something that'll, think, that'll, that'll mess up everybody else. Now this is what I think of every time somebody comes up and says, hey, uh, our system's pretty good shape, but every time we do this one little button click, it's really slow. And then some guy goes, oh, oh, I know, let's change the SDU, TDU size for everybody. Well, that's this story in, in Oracle terms. So um, anything that you can do that, that that is a global type of a change. You know, parameter changes, let's build a whole new bunch of indexes for this, let's drop a whole bunch of indexes for this. Those are the kinds of things that can mess stuff up for everybody else. The first thing I'd compel you to do is take a look at the profile for the thing that's slow for you and figure out why, or not why necessarily, figure out whether this thing is efficient or not. And if it's not efficient, then fix that inefficiency first before you go jacking around with something that's gonna mess everybody else up. Which brings us to the topic of efficiency. Another short section, efficiency defined is an inverse measure of waste. And I like this Nehru quote. Obviously, the highest type of efficiency is that which can utilize existing material to the best advantage. Now, of course, you're at a show where there's a bunch of people here trying to sell you new stuff to take care of your problems. But you all know that the cheapest way to solve your problems is to figure out something that, that is clever or that causes you to be able to use what you already have more efficiently. I'll stop the blasphemy now. Um, Kind of rule one of optimization, 
is this. The fastest way to do anything is find a way to not have to do that thing at all. Right? What's the fastest way to commute to work? Telecommute. Don't go to work at all. What's the fastest way to do this hash join? Figure out that I really didn't need to do that hash join in the first place, and you just skip it. Um, that leads to a technique which I like to talk about. And this is hard for especially junior people to do, and especially developers, because it just feels sometimes like your job is to take commands from other people. You get in the habit of when somebody says, this is how it shall be, you implement that. But sometimes it's appropriate to ask the question, is this apparent requirement really a legitimate requirement? Because if you go back to this prior slide, that's really what you're asking. If somebody says, we need to return the 600,000 closest rental cars to the kiosk at which somebody is attempting to rent a mid-sized car, you need to ask the question, why does somebody want to see the other 599,995 rental cars that they probably don't care about? So a slow application can become a quick application once you figure out that the application doesn't really need to do the work that maybe the original specifier thought it needed to do. And that's part of what I talked about the other day in the messed up apps session. So this is a nice thing about efficiency. Improvements that make your program more efficient can produce tremendous benefits for everybody else on the system, not just people that use the thing that got improved, but people that use the system on which now there's a less inefficient thing going on. Um, and I'll show you why on the next slide. It's because of load. Load defined is competition for a resource by concurrent task executions. Busier means more waiting, but you already knew that. So there are two types of waiting. There's queuing delay and there's coherency delay. And I'll address each of those in its own section. So here we are on section 13, queuing delay. Queuing delay is what happens when you get in line for something, but there are other people ahead of you that are going to get access to that thing that you're waiting for before you get your shot at. So if you've ever been to a Wendy's, if you've ever been to an airport, if you've ever been to a toll booth on a highway, you've queued before. This quite famous picture is a graph of the relation between the busyness of the system on the horizontal axis and the amount of response time that's going to be required for you to wait on the vertical axis. The components of response time in this picture are two. There's the service time, which is the amount of time you're going to spend actually having your hamburger cooked once you order it. And then there's the amount of time that you're going to spend queued up waiting to tell somebody what kind of hamburger you'd like for them to prepare for you. So on a very unloaded, unbusy system, your response time and your service time are, are roughly equivalent because you don't spend any time in the queue. But on a busier system with more of your friends competing against you for the resource that you're wanting, you're going to spend more time and queued waiting to place your order to get your service later. Now, this is one of those, um, like in the first physics class you ever took, where most of the problems start with um, assume a spherical cow of uniform density. Remember those? This is one of those. This is kind of an assume no friction type of a model of queuing delay. It's actually worse than this in reality because of coherency delays and other things we'll talk about later. But on a theoretically perfect system with no friction, no funny interactions between CPUs that are trying to process things for different people, you know, no, no hamburger cookers bumping into each other and dropping stuff on the floor behind the counter, even if everything were perfect, response time degrades hyperbolically once load gets so high that this curve starts on its uptick. And I'll show you more about that in the next section called the knee. The knee is actually a fairly controversial term, and I won't explain the details of that in this time slot, but if you look at the paper, which you can get in the proceedings or at methodr.com, you'll see some extra stuff about the knee. Um, the knee comes about because you have two performance goals. You want great response times, that is a low response time, and you want great throughput, that is you want high throughput. Well, the problem with that is these two goals contradict one another. It's like there's a slider bar, and you can have one or the other, but whichever one you pick, it's at the expense of the other one. So what you want to try to figure out is what's the optimal setting of throughput versus response time. And that's what this knee thing is all about. The knee is where the throughput and response time are an optimal balance. Mathematically, it's the, it's the utilization on that graph, the knee-shaped curve, at which response time divided by utilization is at its minimum. And it happens to be the point that I've drawn with the red dot here. I've shown two different systems, a, a, uh, a four-server system that's got a fairly good service time, 
that's this blue curve here. And then I've got a 16 um, server system that has somewhat worse service times, but you can see that the 16, um, 16 server system scales a little better. And at some point, the blue one becomes worse than the purple one because of the blue one scalability advantage. Well, it's a lot of math behind figuring out where this optimal point is, and you don't have to do it because I've done it for you. Here are the numbers. If you've got a uh, two hamburger flipper or two cash register Oracle, I'm sorry, a two cash register Wendy's hamburger shop, for example, then the knee utilization is 57%. If you've got uh, eight CPU SMP system, then the knee utilization is 74%, and so forth. I didn't show you all the numbers, but these are the common uh, number of CPUs you might have types of numbers. Now, every resource has a need. That is, for example, your CPU subsystem, your I.O. subsystem, your network I.O. subsystem, your disks, of course. Um, and your knee, since you live in a world in which your cows are not perfectly spherical and of uniform density, your knees are probably worse than the knees that I put on this diagram up in front of you. So why do we care about the knee at all? Well, the answer is because left of this particular magic point in this, in this graph about queuing theory, response times are stable and consistent. And remember, that's important because your customers feel the variance, not the mean. Well, to the right of this point, there are dragons, where even small changes in utilization, it's hard to pick out here in all the red, but a small change in utilization will create a large change in response time. And this is what happens when, as a consultant, I've gone into many systems in my past where um, sometimes the user will hit enter and a report will come in, in, in two seconds, but sometimes they'll hit enter and the same exact report with the same exact input variables will take 45 seconds. And it's because of local spikes in utilization that cause us to be driven out past this knee in this particular performance curve. Now that all takes us to capacity planning because this concept of a knee is intimately bound up in the concept of capacity planning. And I think capacity planning, I think of it in very simple terms. Basically, I think of it in terms of two boxes, a blue box and a red box that I'll show you in a minute. The blue box that I'm showing you here, you can think of as a utilization uh, charts background. And there are a couple of interesting places. 0% utilized is an interesting place. 50% is an interesting place. 100% is obviously an interesting place as well. And I'm going to encourage you to mark your knee as a fourth interest, or, yeah, one, two, three, fourth interesting place. And the reason for that will be clear in a second. Now, whatever capacity you have, that capacity exists to serve your workload. And the workload I draw is a red box within the blue box. So when you have blue left over, that means you can add more work without the system tipping over. But if you have too much blue, that means you probably paid more for your box than you might, might have needed to. So what you want is load that's kind of close to your knee but that doesn't exceed your knee because you don't want those freaky vacillating response time problems that happen when you're out to the right in that curve that I showed a while ago that looks like a hockey stick. So capacity planning in these terms is actually fairly easy. Uh, capacity planning is the question how big does the capacity have to be? How big does the blue box have to be? But tightly intertwined with capacity management is workload management. Workload management is basically the question of how small can I make the red box. So if you've got somebody who's gifted at doing this, you can actually buy smaller systems. And you can pay less for your, for your IT department, which is a goal for most people. So to perform well, you have to, and the reason this word manage is, is in red, it's a verb, it's something you have to actually go do. It's work you have to do. To perform well, you have to manage your load so that utilizations do not exceed their needs. Pretty simple. If load does exceed a need, then you've really got three choices. And you can see these from the blue box, red box picture that I drew. You can either reschedule load, which is the act of taking red pixels out of that box and putting them in some other time period's box, like tonight at 4 a.m. Or you can eliminate waste, like for example, finding a better execution plan for the SQL, or figuring out that, wow, we really don't need to return 600,000 rows. We can just return five rows and the user's even happier. So that's waste elimination. That's typically the biggest bang for the buck that you're going to get. I listed rescheduling first because that's typically the easiest thing to do. No change control, you just sort of quietly don't run tomorrow morning's report until tonight instead of running it today at 2.30 where it collides with everything else. Or you can increase capacity. You can buy a bigger blue box. The reason I listed it last and I made it red is because it's expensive and sometimes it doesn't work. 
Sometimes, it's, sometimes it actually makes performance worse. Now let's talk for a moment about random arrivals. I think I got five minutes, so I'm going to go through this. Um, actually, I'm going to. Now I'm not going to skip it. I'll show you real quick. There are two ways that requests can arrive in a system. Randomly, like this. So what I've got is six arrivals that came in in 30 seconds, which is an average arrival rate of 0.2 arrivals per second. Or I can have the same six arrivals come in like a robot generated them. And it's two totally different experiences. Even though it looks like 0.2 arrivals per second, these systems will perform entirely differently. Because up here, people are going to have to wait on each other, whereas down here the system can probably deal with you quite, quite naturally. Random arrivals, deterministic arrivals, they're absolutely not the same. Even though their average metrics look the same, they're absolutely not the same. When you have a deterministic system, you can have 100% CPU utilization. You can have 100% utilization on any device that you want, if you know when your next request is coming in. But on a random arrival system, you have to keep utilizations below their knees because you have to have headspace left over for that request that's coming next which by definition of random arrivals, you don't know when that's going to be. I'll talk quickly about coherency delay. Coherency delay is the duration that a task spends communicating and coordinating resources across processes, basically. So a quick diagram of coherency delay. I'm going to switch from response time to a throughput graph. This particular graph is what benchmarkers typically show in their, in their output. They'll show that as we add load on the system, we found that we got more load through the back end of the system. As we add cars to the highway, we got more people to work. But at a certain point, we hit this congestion location where if it weren't for anything but queuing delay, the curve would have looked like the blue curve here. But because of coherency delay, that is certain processes needing a resource that another process is holding and doesn't let go of until its code path lets go of it, well, that causes an actual further degradation, which not only just diminishes your return, it actually can make throughput worse. And that's what this green turquoise type of line is all about. In a nutshell, for Oracle practitioners, coherency delay is things like log file sync, NQ, buffer busy weights, latch free, those kinds of things. It's where one process is holding your resource. You can't get to it just by waiting in a queue. You actually have to do something special in relation to that other process. Which takes us to performance testing. The problem is that there are these queuing delays, there's coherency delays, there's code path that does CPU stuff that may take longer, may take shorter, just because of how many instructions it has to execute. How can you test for all that stuff? And the answer is two parts. Part one is I guarantee you'll catch more problems if you try to catch problems than if you don't try. Um, and that's because of this. This is Barry Bohm's very famous um, cost of fixing a bug depending upon what project phase you're in. If, the, uh, if you catch a bug in the requirements phase, you don't pay too much. Vertical axis is the cost. If you catch something in, in operations, it costs a lot more. Now most of you think, well this isn't a line, isn't it supposed to be this kind of hyperbola thing? And it actually is. Uh, Bohm's graph is done on a logarithmic vertical scale. So it truly is exponentially, actually hyperbolically more expensive to catch and fix a performance problem in operation than it is to fix during the requirements or design or coding phase of a project. So you need to try because it's so much cheaper to fix problems early in a project than it is late. You need to try to find the problems. But no matter how well you do at performance testing, you will never catch them all. There are some problems that developers are creating today that you won't discover until October of next year. Now, I'm not picking on developers. I'm a developer, too. And I create problems every day that I find out about later. Now, the key is to shorten that feedback loop. What you need is a plan. So the plan is, guess what? Measure it. You need to measure throughput and response time because they're important. If it's important, you need to measure it because it makes that thing easier to manage. Well, even if it's hard, you still need to measure them. Uh, because SMS, surrogate measures suck. I don't care how easy it is to go figure out what your utilization is. If you don't know what your response time is, you still need to go find out what response times are. Response time and throughput need to be measured because surrogate measures of them don't work. Now the good news is that performance is easy to measure when the application measures it. 
can hand a specification to a, to a developer and say, I want you to look up a zip code in a table, and I want you to, to publish someplace in a log file how long it takes to do it. That is such an easy specification that it's unbelievable. And the way it's implemented, what time is it, do the work, what time is it, subtract, write the difference to a file. It's not hard for a developer to do this at all. And it's not hard for them to do it in a very efficient way because syscalls to find out what time it is are a lot cheaper than that than they were 10 years ago. People have been working on this problem. And that leads me to the observation that's the final section of this particular slideshow. Performance is a feature. The problem is you don't know how your application is going to work prior to actually putting it into production. You can hire all 40,000 of your users and you can have them come into the campus on Saturday and work the application just like it's a Tuesday. It's not a Tuesday. And no matter how thoroughly you think you've tested your app, you didn't test everything that's going to happen to it in reality. So you need to have hooks in your application so that you can fix performance problems easily when they are discovered. So what I want to leave you with, well, I've got another slide or two after this, but the, the, the summary of this particular section is the last couple of lines from the paper uh, that you can download for free. Uh, the software designer who integrates performance measurement into his product is much more likely to create a fast application and, more importantly, an application that will become faster over time. What I hope for is that every one of these 21 topics, as a, as a unioned group of database administrators, sysadmins, and developers, you found relevant to your career or to your, what you're going to have to do when you get back, on, uh, back to work on Friday. And I'm hopeful that these things all now fit in the intersection for you. Um, I took all my time. I'm going to be around. If you have questions, I welcome you to come up. Um, thank you very much.